Hello everyone. Um, my name is Chetan Nebarak. I am currently working as a Chief Product and Technology Officer for Analytica Data Labs. In today's session, I intend to spend 25 to 30 minutes um, talking through some of the Gen AI abilities that we've been building uh, in our product leaps, which is essentially a low-code, no-code platform. And I'll give a bit more context about that in, in uh, just a few minutes. But before I get started, a little bit of background and introduction about myself. I have been working in the space of AI, ML, deep learning for the last 12 years now. By, by education, I'm, I've done two masters. I'm an MBA from ENPC Paris and also a master's in advanced computer science with focus on AI. I started off with computer vision and went on to build DL models in, predicting, in price prediction engines and then a few other models around in the fintech space, which were really about doing evaluations using machine learning models for both insurance and loans. And then the last one and a half, two years, I've been working on the product to build in generative AI abilities, and that's been the focus for the last 18 months or so. And my today's discussion uh, will revolve around uh, one of the products that uh, uh, we have built and rolled out, uh, which is both stable and it's scaling rapidly. One of, um, and one of the abilities, and I will talk through uh, some of our experiences there and some of the best practices that uh, we have uh, seen that has worked for us uh, as we moved along from POC to production, which is a very apt topic for, for our discussion today. So moving on, four essential talking points today. I'll start off by giving the context of the app, and then I'll uh, move on to talk about the various components that go into the, the app architecture or the abilities architecture. And then a little bit of discussion on prompts and rank, rank. And then finally, a quick note on what's coming next and what are the things that we're working on next. So that's the agenda for this discussion. Coming to the context of the app, like I mentioned earlier, the, the app really is built ground up for the data citizen, for people who are non-technical. This is a low-code, no-code platform which does end-to-end -end data science. And it you can not only build models, so it has abilities which are pre-modeling um, abilities, it has the modeling abilities, and of course the post-modeling abilities which is deploying and serving the models. And we are continuously enhancing that as we integrate with the larger ecosystem in this space. The, the app that uh, I'm talking about today in this session is the uh, RAG-based inference engine. In fact, these are multiple uh, RAG pipelines. Um, so there is a parent -like RAG pipeline which uh, integrates into child pipelines and the parent RAG pipelines really is the orchestration layer. This inference engine is akin to a copilot and this tries to take the user through various aspects of bringing down the barriers to learning and the barriers to working with the with the platform as raj we are trying to address three broad umbrella questions or abilities with this copilot the first one being what can i do next which is nothing but the recommendation engine again a rack pipeline the second one being what else can i do this is this is basically the scenarios engine where the llm model uh, and the associated lag pipeline come to an agreement in an assisted mode with the user as to what the intent is in terms of the scenario and then the back back and workflow build those scenarios for the user and then lastly is the do it for me which is our processing engine again abilities different abilities in product coming together in a rack pipeline the processing engine essentially helps the user give a very few inputs and generate or either generate models, do any kind of pre-processing and even build charts and dashboards. So these are the three broad abilities of the co-pilot and then there are some abilities which again are part of this larger three uh, umbrella abilities. Uh, so that's the context um, uh, of the uh, app and uh, this is uh, this app that we've been focused on the last one year and we've been evolving our uh, RAG architectures um, to enable this co-pilot abilities. How did we get started? Uh, obviously we got started like everybody else did, uh, building um, simple, simple RAG architectures or pipeline. But um, uh, we obviously had to move on to making sure that whatever that we are building is is relevant to to the user and has the the right responses. 
So we had to quickly move to a more evaluation driven development or metric driven development and then gradually we built our evaluation landscape which is again growing as there are more and more tools available and more and more metrics become available for every component that is there as part of the entire rack pipeline. We are gradually adopting to that, but as of now, I think stands today, uh, these are three key moving parts to our metrics-driven development, to our entire evaluation landscape. We are, in terms of approach, very reference-based, which means that everything that we're doing based on ground truth. And to do that, obviously, you need a very, you need rock-solid gold standard eval data. We we are continuously building that, again, completely uh, labeled and annotated by humans. In terms of the scope of evaluation, we do end-to-end and, of course, component-based. When it comes to component-based, we right now focus again more on the the retrieval and the generative components. But we are moving towards building more evaluation metrics, including unit testing, as we bring in more complexity and more components in our our pipeline. So generative and retrieval metrics are built using the Raga framework, and we're using the standard uh, matrix there of um, F1 score, which is basically a good balance between uh, precision and recall. Uh, as far as retrieval is concerned and uh, for generative we are uh, basing our evaluation on faithfulness and answer relevancy. The other element, important element of our metrics driven development is, is the design consideration. This is, this is key point or guiding principle rather which helps us uh, figure out what are the kind of metrics we need to build, bring in and also what are the kind of uh, components which we need to either enhance or what additional layers uh, are needed. In terms of the design consideration, we uh, use three, deterministic versus non-deterministic, which basically means that whether how much of large language models are we going to be using for each of our components. We are currently using a two, two, two of our components to use large language models. And we gradually evaluate that and based on how much of deterministic and non-deterministic components we have, that will drive our evaluation landscape as well. And then next, of course, is uns very important. Now, when we started off, we were very boundaried. We we did not allow an open conversation. But now gradually from single turn conversations, we have moved on to multiple turns. And then we will open up, make it a very free flow text. We are still a little boundaried, but we are multi-turn conversational co-pilot. That's what the current state is. And we are continuously testing that. And the third important design consideration is the prompt flow based on, again, whether single turn, multiple turn, the complexity, the use case of the co-pilot. And as we build in more and more abilities in co-pilot, I've spoken about the three umbrella, but then within that, there are a lot of those smaller abilities that determines what is the kind of prompt engineering and prompt flow that will be needed, whether these are complex queries which needs decomposition or they need any other query enhancement treatment. Based on that, we decide what kind of enhancement or component we will be needing and what metrics we will be needing. So this is really our evaluation landscape and how we go about bring, taking these three pillars to drive our metrics-driven development. In terms of how we progressed on this, we started off with eyeballing uh, at the POC stage. And throughout the POC stage, all that the teams were doing was eyeballing. And as we were doing eyeballing, we had our experts, which is our analytical team, which started to use the eyeballing eyeballing outputs and the pairs of query context and responses to build in the uh, eval data. Uh, so we started building the eval data right from our POC stage. We also use certain synthetic data generators to, to build those pairs. And then we moved on to doing, as we developed more larger eval data set, we moved on to doing the structured supervised evaluation. And now, of course, we're trying to move to LM as a judge. This, of course, needs very sophisticated prompt engineering. And once we have achieved, achieved this, uh, we'll, we'll have a, f- a full instrumentation or automation of our uh, evaluation. But these are the three. These are the three prominent stages in our evaluation journey. We are just about starting to use LLM as a judge, but our, we continue to use eyeballing and our supervised ground truth evaluation model is working well for us. So that was around evaluation, which is really the big piece, and that takes a lot of our time. And then the next important element or pillar is the data pre-processing. We started off with various chunking methodologies, fixed chunk, fixed chunking, content-based chunking, but we settled on to semantic chunking because when we did our comparisons, the semantic chunking was 
were, were working best for us. But then it depends on the kind of use case and the source data data that you have. You could potentially be using a hybrid chunking strategy, which might just work better. Passing is, of course, the most fundamental thing. That's where everything starts, depending on what kind of documents you have, whether those are code files, those are web pages or PDFs for documents or even images. Depending on that, you would be using different pa- passing algorithms or tools. We've tried many, We've and our current tech stack is inclined more on the parser available from the Llama landscape. Sparse and dense retrievers, we we are starting to feel that we would be needing dense retrievers now. Although sparse retrievers have worked for us, the DF, IDF and BM25 is what we have used so far. But we have started to get some vocabulary mismatch problems and uh, teams have now started the next POC of putting the dense retriever components in our rack pipeline. We have been focusing on metadata from day one. A lot of our abilities are driven by this metadata. And when we say metadata, metadata in context of rack obviously is the metadata of the documents and the metadata of the chunks and also the potential metadata around even prompts if you're doing good prompt versioning. But we also do metadata around the context of the user and that context is built in what we refer to as the the organizational business map and their KPI so we capture that metadata too and all of this is in our metadata database from where we pull in uh, the context which then gets fed into which I earlier mentioned into our orchestration layer and then from where we do the routing for the various uh, rack pipelines. So these are the four essential elements of our data pre-processing that we currently engaged in and now starting to experiment uh, and bringing the dense retriever capabilities in our platform. Query enhancement, we didn't do much of it initially, but we we wanted to ensure that we have the best practices in place to uh, make sure that the intent is fully understood. And as the as we opened up and as things became more conversational and the conversational uh, boundaries were uh, loosened up, it was it became clear that enhancements would be needed to break down complex queries to decompose them to ensure that the intent becomes very clear. So we do uh, query decomposition and we use a large language model there. The other thing that we started to do now is to do is to do height, which is again using which will be using a large language model. It really goes a little further than using a supervised encoder and it builds theoretical documents and those documents can then be you know, classified as part of one classification of documents from where we then generate uh, pairs of queries which are very relevant to that particular chunk. So chunk classification is a, a something that we intend to build by not only using the document chunks that we have through our semantic chunking but also by using the hide uh, technique. The routing, we've been using this since day one because we have different databases. So we have a routing layer and this routing layer based on which which database we need to send the query to uh, does its job. So the routing layer is responsible to understand the query and again it's basically decomposing as the queries become more complex, understanding the intent of the query and then routing it to the correct place. Now. As we do all of these things, it is it is one of our challenge is to ensure that the complex complexities that we're building in they don't impact uh, the latency. And so our DevOps team, our infrastructure team are, are all a very integral part of doing everything on the rack pipeline and bu- building the rack abilities and what kind of deployment architectures and um, infrastructure we can use. We currently are uh, on AWS, the product is on AWS, and we are increasingly evaluating every service uh, in the Gen AI ability on AWS, including the uh, serverless abilities um, uh, that AWS has to offer to ensure that we offer good uh, uh, latency. We, in terms of our, in terms of our go-to market, we are very B two B, a high touch model, but our abilities are low touch. While we don't do a hundred percent SaaS based model, so it it is sometimes behind the firewalls. Uh, the application is sometimes behind the firewalls of the customer. So we have to be uh, very clear in terms of the way various architectures that are needed based on the usage and concurrency and also the associated cost. Our trade-offs is very important and we spend a lot of time understanding that uh, and building the infrastructure architecture around that. So that's the, that's the other important piece and element of our, of our larger pipeline which is continuous enhancement of the queries. 
the next the obvious candidate uh, after query enhancement that we worked on significantly on and we continue to work is the retriever and re-ranking we didn't have we we had re-ranking from very early days but more retriever abilities are gradually being built we generally classify these ability in three broad categories is the is, is retriever post retriever and and generation and while there are a lot more techniques here i have only mentioned on on the slide the ones that we either are using or we intend to start building immediately ib retriever is we have had this since day one the filter vector search which is simply a filter on top of your vector search that's that is standard now in most rank architectures and we um, we continue to use that re-ranking we we've tried both bi-coder and cross encoder uh, settled on a cross encoder and we we found that the cross encoder works better in our use cases simply because it compares two sentences and pairs so as long as you have a good training data of pairs cross encoder is a way to go and we currently use the cohere ranker which is which works on cross encoder uh, but we do have certain by 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 encoder still working but i think gradually we're going to phase them out hierarchical indexing again seems like this has been adopted well and has become a standard this is this significantly enhances the precision of the rack application you simply in a hierarchical indexing you we organize the data in a hierarchical structure as the name suggests and you have categories and subcategories based on on relevance and relationships and the retrieval process focuses on those relationships and the relevance and the and they process the retrieval by doing what we call as a parent and uh, and child nodes hierarchical indexing is we use extensively so that's working for us c rank crank whichever way we pronounce it which is corrective corrective rank this is a new technique we've started to use this or experiment with this so we have current peers which are running in this c rack is is it it brings in another component which is a, a lightweight retriever and this retriever really self evaluates the the quality of the documents retrieved and it provides a confidence index so we are we hopeful that this particular component is again going to along with the llm as a judge help us instrument do the full instrumentation of of a evaluation landscape like i said that we want to move towards as much of automated evaluation as possible why we will still be focused on making sure that uh, eval data sets are robust but having produced those eval data sets we want rest of the pieces to be really as automated as possible fine tuning again very helpful this is the generation we keep the llms that we use fine tuned based on whatever the context of the llm is, is whether it is for generation or whether it is for query decomposition or even some of the other abilities that we're building that would require a use of llm so we that's a standard practice wherever we have data we fine tune it wherever we don't we generate synthetic data and we fine tune it so that's the retrieval and re-ranking abilities that we have and that we currently using and the one i spoke about c rank that we intend to use going forward so that was about the various principal components that we have in in our rack pipeline our rack pipeline at a very high level has it looks like the the pipeline that i have on the deck we have uh, the queries uh, then we have query transformation we have routing across three different databases we have the product docs database we have the user history and what we have the context db the context db is is really the context of the business wherein we have the business maps the processes the features all of which is used to develop analytical models we currently using like i said two places a large language models one for query decomposition where we using chain of chain of thought prompt engineering and we using prompting for augmentation process so the key takeaway really is that uh, prompt engineering and rag are really tied together obviously we don't hope we don't want to over engineer prompt engineering wherever it's not required but the key takeaway is that wherever we use whichever component uses a large language model that is where we will be uh, using sophisticated prompt engineering and that is how uh, these two are really Uh, married to each other um a, a simple rag probably uses prompt engineering only in the augmentation process uh, but as you bring in more and more llms for different components as i spoke about sophisticated prompt engineering is absolutely a bedrock for doing relevant and a more uh, correct uh, pipeline 
In terms of our next steps, we are trying to move to a modular rack architecture. This is also the need and from our customers, wherein we are going to be doing subscription-based pricing. So there are different abilities, and these abilities need to be dockerized and deployed in a microservices architecture. So making sure that we are ready for that. And as are each of these components or these services uh, grow, not in terms of the usage, but also in terms of the data that they're handling and the kind of responses that they need to generate. So as that grows and it becomes more sophisticated, we these services need to take a life on its own, of their own, and we would need to move towards a modular RAG architecture. We are one of our challenges has been versioning of prompts. So we are evaluating different products, wherein we can have end-to-end versioning of prompts. Also, because like I said, we are putting in more and more LLMs in uh, different components of the RAG architecture. We are almost ready with the with the unit testing, and we are using Proudfoo for that, and that's something which has become part of our development life cycle. And that is currently is almost uh, a practice now. And then lastly, we're looking at agentic abilities wherever they are needed. Like I said earlier, when I was describing about the application, there is the parent orchestration engine, inference engine, and right now is built on custom rules. But we intend to bring in use of other tools as well to make sure that context is brought in from other data sources and we have agentic abilities there. So those are the, some of the next steps that we intend to take. And that's that was a high-level view of what our application does, what is the current architecture of our RAC pipelines, and some of the learnings that we have had on working on these abilities for the last one year. So I think I'm back on time. I hope I hope this session was useful and the audience got some important pointers from this. I will be very happy to take questions whenever the opportunity arises. Thank you so much for being there and listening.